I was sitting in an uncomfortably small room in the San Diego County Jail. I was there to interview a prisoner. Let me call her Lisa. Lisa had just pled guilty to possession of methamphetamine for sale. It's her 13th or 14th time she'd been arrested for this. I was part of a team that's trying to assess where she had gotten to where she was and how we might change her life course. Lisa comes into the room. She's wearing an orange prison jumpsuit. Her hands and feet are shackled together with silver chains. She's in her mid-40s. She sits down, and the room is so small, we're almost knee to knee. I introduced myself, and I started this interview. And I said, when did you first start using marijuana? Age 13. When did you first start using methamphetamine? Age 13. I said, well, what happened to you when you were 13? She said, oh, my mom was a meth user, and she wants someone to party with. So she introduced me to meth. Now, Lisa had been raped because of meth. She had prostituted herself because of meth. She married a man who was a meth user who beat her regularly, once actually fracturing her skull and almost killing her. She had two teenage children who lived with relatives far from her. Lisa was homeless and supported herself by selling meth. After this question, Lisa paused and she started sobbing. And she said, and now when my mother calls me in prison and says I love you to me, I can't say it back to her. So breaking all appropriate clinical protocol, I said, I don't think you have to. Your mother did a terrible thing to you. So I spent 10 years running experiments in my laboratory to understand good and bad behavior. How is it possible to treat a child so badly? But more generally, why do any of us treat anybody well or badly? I discovered a key role for the molecule oxytocin. When oxytocin is released by the brain, people display a variety of moral behaviors. They're generous, they're kind, they're compassionate, they're caring. In the absence of oxytocin, we see selfish behaviors, aggressive behaviors. In fact, scientists know a lot about fear and aggression, but really didn't have a target to understand the positive behaviors that humans engage in until we found the role of oxytocin. I call it the moral molecule. And yet, some people's behaviors are stuck in one corner or the other. So I want to talk today about the biology of good and evil. So think of your own lives. Look at this audience. I see some great-looking people, wonderful, kind, intelligent people. A couple of the folks in the back I'm not so sure about, but everybody else looks good. Okay, so what about you guys? Have you ever, you wonderful people, ever screamed in anger at someone you care about? Right, what's that about? Right, how do we do that? What's that switch point? That's what I'm interested in. How do we turn it on and turn it off? But I have to tell you, I'm a complete skeptic when I talk to people. People say, oh, you know, I feed the homeless, I save little puppies. Who knows what people are doing? So instead, we run experiments where we tempt people with virtue and vice by putting money on the table. So we're going to run a couple experiments right here in the theater, all right? So here's the first one. Let me split the theater in half. Everybody on my right, imagine I've endowed you with 100 euros, okay? And you're going to get matched with somebody on the left side of the theater. By, say, by using your smartphone. So you match with some other person, and they have zero euros. Okay, so people on the right, here's your task. You have to decide to send a message to that person who you can't see, you won't talk to, they don't know who you are. You have to offer them a split of that 100 euros. Any amount you want. But here's the trick. If the people on the left get that message, and they don't like your offer, they can say, refuse, and all the money gets burned. Okay, so how much money do you offer? How much? 50. Okay, 50, that's the most common. So in developed countries, offers of half, the fair split, are the most common offers, and people who get offered 50 always accept. Okay, people on the left, what if they offered you five? What would you do, accept or reject? Reject. reject. These guys are stingy bastards, right? <laughs> Come on. Now Lisa, when she did this task with me, the prisoner, she immediately said 50. I sort of wrote it down. So why 50? She said, if you're a drug dealer and you cheat, you die. Right, this is why scientists need to get out of the lab and study the free roaming humans. <laughs> Undergraduates who participate in my experiments never use that thought process, okay? 
All right, so I took this share the money task and asked a different question. Why would someone over here ever make a generous offer? Why would they ever make an offer that's more than it needs to be accepted? Right, because you make a generous offer, you're losing money. And I'm going to torture you in my lab. Turns out if I take a squirt of oxytocin, spray it up your nose, let it get into your brain, offers are 80% more generous. Or if I show you a little movie, sad movie, about a two-year-old boy who's dying of brain cancer, your brain pumps out oxytocin and you're much more generous. So oxytocin connects us to other people. It's a molecule that evolved to motivate care for offspring, but in humans, this system works so powerfully that we care about complete strangers. But in that is so much power. We can extract so much value from interacting with a larger group of individuals than just a little clan or tribe that we're aware of. Right? This is really an amazing molecule. Okay, great, so we have this moral molecule, and in fact, 95% of the thousands of people I've taken blood from release this molecule and someone shows them a kindness. So oxytocin encapsulates the golden rule. The golden rule exists in every culture on the planet. The golden rule says, look, if you're nice to me, I'll be nice to you. That's just how oxytocin works. You're nice to me, my brain releases oxytocin. It says, oh, it's one of those good people. It's kind of like my family. You're one of me, I'm gonna be nice back to you. Okay. Great, so everything works perfectly for 95% of the population. What about the 5% who it doesn't work for? So there's a variety of ways that this system breaks down. Of that 5%, about 2% of these individuals appear to have genes that predispose them to not process oxytocin. These individuals are born essentially with bad genes. And psychologically, they look like psychopaths. Psychopaths classically lack empathy. And for healthy people, when we release oxytocin, the reason we care about someone is because oxytocin makes us feel empathy. We feel connected emotionally to people around us. That's why we care for our kids. That's why we uh, care for our spouses. That's why we care about complete strangers. We're emotionally connected to them. That's very valuable for social creatures like us. But psychopaths don't have that. They lack empathy. And believe me, when they're in my experiments, they take all the money on the table, and they're happy to do it. They want to come back the next day. So psychopaths, 1% to 2% of the population, 25 to 40% of the prison population. They are dangerous. I recommend you avoid them. Among that 5%, we find a couple other percent of these are individuals who had very adverse childhood histories. So we did a study of women who were repeatedly sexually abused as children. We find that half of them don't release oxytocin when someone shows them a kindness. Why is that? This brain circuit that uses oxytocin, that for most of us makes it feel good to do good, shuts down. They haven't been shown love. They haven't been nurtured. And so this brain circuit says, I'm not being used. I'll redeploy for some other purpose. Okay. So it's important to have sufficient nurturing. Now, the good news is you need really a severely bad childhood for the system to break down. It's very robust. It's very evolutionarily ancient. And yet we still see the system not working well. And for these individuals who are abused or neglected, they have very poor uh, long-term outcomes. The last reason we see bad behavior in the world is having a bad day. So it turns out that high levels of stress inhibit the release of oxytocin. High levels of stress put our bodies and brains into survival mode. It says, I gotta get to the next two minutes and survive whatever this is. I'm really stressed out. I don't care about stepping over other people to get out of that burning airplane. I'm gonna do whatever it takes. So you guys know this, right? You're having a bad day and you grump at the people around you. Then what do you have to do the next day? You gotta go back and go to your spouse, your colleague, Gee, I was a jerk yesterday. You know, I was really nasty to you. I'm so sorry. And you repair that relationship, right? So we know this. We know that sometimes people do behave badly. It doesn't mean they're bad people. They can be having a bad day. And guess what else kills the oxytocin system? Long-term use of stimulants like methamphetamine. So one reason that Lisa's mother perhaps couldn't care for her is that she had damaged these care circuits forcing this huge amount of uh, rewarding chemicals in the brain, it shuts down, and all of a sudden, it doesn't feel good to care for your child. All you want is the next high. Okay, I'm gonna do another experiment to show you how we understand the other side of human behavior. How did you feel when you heard the story about Lisa and her mother, what her mother did to her? I felt angry. 
I felt the sort of moral indignation. How is it possible to do something so terrible to a child? So we want to study another way that we sustain these moral behaviors, which is punishment. Right? So if I saw Lisa's mother, I don't want to give her an earful. Right? I don't want to tell her how bad this is. What we do is that we use substances that shut down the oxytocin response. I'm going to give one to myself right now. This is, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> this is synthetic testosterone. It's a gel. I'm going to rub it on my shoulders. And about an hour from now, some of this is going to leak into my brain. And when it does leak into my brain, my perspective is going to narrow from the, from the future to the present. I'm going to take more risk. And if I see a social slight, I'm much more willing to engage to cause that person to behave the way I want them to. I've got a shirt. All right, I'll do the rest of my talk with a shirt off. Right, so what we do is we infuse testosterone into men. We have them do this same share the money task. And guess what happens? These alpha males we've created, they're selfish. Testosterone says, it's all about you. You're a little god. So they don't send very much money if they're reverse decision makers. But if they're on the left side of the theater, they're receiving proposals, they will burn all the money if you're not really fair. So these high testosterone individuals enforce the rules. They suppress this empathic response from oxytocin. They say, look, you better play by the rules. I'm going to come get you. So in other experiments where we take blood and measure responses to things like non-cooperation, men but not women get this big spike in testosterone. And they will use all the resources available to them to shut down this interaction. It's not going to happen when I'm around. Right, so we have this interesting biology of care and punishment right inside us. And this helps us navigate through the sea of strangers in which we live. We're constantly modulating our behavior. Care for that person, they're being nice to me. Oh, this person's being not so nice to me? Sure, I'm going to put my chest out and, you know, uh, engage with you. All right, so this doesn't only matter in the laboratory. It turns out it matters actually in the world we live in. So this gentleman on the right, is a guy named Hans Reiser. Uh, Reiser was a rising star in Silicon Valley in the 1990s. He was an internet entrepreneur, very hard driving, married the woman on the left from Russia. They had a little child. And after some number of years, she decided she wanted to divorce him. So instead of letting her divorce him, he instead decides to kill her. Dumps her body, it's never found. And you guys know, right? When a woman dies, it's always the spouse, right? So he's the suspect, he goes to court, the trial proceeds. On the last day of trial, it's very clear he's going to be found guilty. In California, we have the death penalty. So he's facing the death penalty. So he pleads guilty on the last day to get away from getting the death penalty. He agrees to, to a life in prison, and he'll show the authorities where he dumped her body in the Berkeley Hills. Nice guy. He goes to prison. He's in prison for life, San Quentin. After a year in prison, he writes a four-page handwritten appeal to the state of California citing my research and claiming that he should have a new trial because his lawyer had what I call oxytocin deficit disorder, ODD, doesn't release oxytocin when someone's nice to them, and therefore it's kind of psychopathic. Right? Think of the thought process. This guy who killed his wife is blaming his lawyer for being a psychopath. All right? So again, these ideas have a lot of value. Now here's the question I can't answer. Is he fully responsible for her death if he can't feel empathy if he can't feel love? I don't know. I don't know where that legal responsibility lies. Well, let me tell you about Lisa. After I spoke to Lisa, instead of serving a prison sentence, she was allowed to spend a year and a half in a lockdown facility, rehab facility, where she dealt with her issues regarding drug abuse. Her goal was to finish that treatment program and get out of San Diego where she had been sucked into the drug life. And she did that. She graduated from this rehab program. She moved to the Midwest, to the city that her children lived in. She was still not able to care for her children, but she's trying to rebuild her relationship with them. Last I heard, she had not contacted her mother. So the dividing line between evil and good behavior is oxytocin. It's really the underlying biology of love. Oxytocin is so evolutionarily old. It's been part of our human nature for so long. I want to encourage you 
to use the L word, love, to the people around you. Tell them that you love them. Tell them that they're important to you so that they know that you'll expend resources, time, energy, to help them be more happy, to be more engaged in life. So if you tell people around you that you love them, they'll get a release of oxytocin, they'll reciprocate, and you'll feel that love too. That's what human beings really need, is to love and to be loved. But of course, the difficult part about love is extending love to people who don't seem to deserve it. Perhaps drug abusers like Lisa, who have abused themselves. But I still think they deserve our love. I think they deserve our love. Thank you very much.